So here we are inside the ISC 152, and it's relatively roomy. Although in fairness, the loader probably needs it, and the main reason is over my shoulder. 21 rounds of separate loading 152mm ammunition could be carried, either AP or HE. Now, this is not a small round. It weighs 40 kilos. That's somewhere a tad over 80 pounds. Imagine trying to lift this up, down, and around onto the loading tray. Uh, short loaders will be doing this standing. Obviously, there's no chance I could be standing and doing this. The rounds are stored too deep, so you're using a lot of leverage in very awkward situations. The rate of fire was only two, maybe three rounds a minute if you had a good loader. And it may seem very slow, but this is why. It is not easy to get the round from here to here. Fortunately, however, as an assault gun, rate of fire is not really important. You can take your time, the fortification or whatever it is that you want to remove is not going anywhere. A little bit further to the left, the AP rounds would be stored back here. Now, they call AP, but realistically, if you hit any tank with a 152 HE round, it is having a very bad day. Armor piercing is really better suited for bunkers, concrete fortifications, things that you want to go a little bit inside before it goes boom. Still a little bit higher up would be hand grenades. Otherwise, the other features that the uh, loader has, he has the tray to his front, uh, which flips forward for loading, and he would have a ramming staff on the back wall. Just underneath me, a little bit to my left, you can see the little portal that we saw on the outside for loading the 152mm ammunition. So it will come in here, then has to be hoisted up into the racks. A little bit further forward than that, you can see on the floor the two torsion bars for one set of road wheels going crosswise. As you can see, one torsion bar is a bit further forward than the other. And this is why when you look at a vehicle from the side with torsion bar suspension, the, the wheels are not symmetrical. One whole set of wheels is further forward. Forward of that, you're going to see the escape hatch, which is underneath the gunner seat. The gunner seat is missing from this particular vehicle. And for the escape hatch uh, is the master power switch. Now, the gunner seat ordinarily would be on a long metal rod, which extends out to here. It would fold up towards the gun breech to allow room for people to move backwards and forwards. Not on this vehicle, but that's okay because it means it's a lot easier for us to show you what's here anyway. Elevation and traverse are simple mechanical cranks. There is a lot of play in this gun. Exactly why I'm able to do this, I'm not sure if that's deliberate or not. Uh, I would have thought it'd be fairly unacceptable. But it cranks relatively easy for a large gun. The elevation handle also has the electrical firing trigger. As you can see, it's a very simple arc a racked arc. For direct fire you could find a CT-10 telescope uh, that would have an effective range of about 3,500 meters. When firing indirect to a range of about 7,000 meters you would use a Hertz panoramic sight which fits into this mounting here. Now it's not ordinarily stowed in here because in order to use it it actually sticks out of the turret roof. You open up the driver's hatch, um, well, actually I call it the driver's hatch, officially it's the front left hatch. With the sight extended out through the hatch, you would then release the hatch ring, spin it around so that your sight is not obstructed by the hatch cover, and that is how you conduct your indirect fire. It does beg a question because the driver's seat is located directly beneath the panoramic sight housing and also the elevation traverse controls, so in order to ingress or egress quickly, does the gun have to be traversed off to the right? possible concern for the driver if he has to get out and hurry. If it wasn't for the fact that he has a large fuel tank right next to him as well. Having the fuel tank right in the front left of the crew compartment was not the most popular feature of this vehicle. However, if you have big pieces of hot metal punching through the front of your 90mm sloped armor, you're probably having a bad day anyway. So the only reasonable way I can think of to get into the driver's position, I've had to traverse the cannon all the way to the left. Uh, that means, of course, the breech comes to the right with the elevation and traverse gear. Uh, they've put a nice convenient handle here, which I suspect I'm supposed to hold on to and just slide forward. <sighs> Actually, this isn't so bad at all. Now, if you remember from the Object 704, I found the driver's position to be absolutely miserable. 
but I suspect that was also because he had a much more angular armor plate. This one with the straight front armor, I have a little bit more room and it's it's actually not bad. I'm reasonably comfortable. I can see the driver's housing to my front. I can reach the gear stick easily enough and throttle. My only concern is that the seat back is a little bit leaning a bit to the rear, may interfere with here. Perhaps there's actually a locking system which locks it up a little bit further and I just haven't found it. Now there are three forms of visibility for the driver, uh, all out of the one same port, but different levels of protection. The simplest, if it's a nice warm sunny day, uh, yeah, don't mind about the wind, don't mind about the cold. The armored housing is up and the triplex sight is down. Now, if you wanted a windshield or if you're worried about some fragmentation, small arms or whatever, not too pushed, uh, what you can do is you can lift up the triplex housing and that gives you a reasonable range of visibility. It's really not bad. Now there is one additional level. If you're really worried about incoming fire, something that you want some serious weight of metal to stop, what you can then do is you can open up these two latches here. This will allow the armored housing to drop down. Now the catch with the armored housing is that it's at such an angle to give you more protection that I can see yeah, maybe about two meters to my front. Uh, you are absolutely reliant upon the commander or somebody else telling you where you're going. Because quite literally, we're looking at a slit maybe this big, aiming down at an angle. It's all but useless. Let's get this out of the way. Okay, other controls in here. The pedals are easy enough to figure out. There's two of them. One on the left is the clutch, as you can imagine. It's a little bit annoying because the instrument panel is in the way of my leg. Perhaps if it was a shorter individual it wouldn't be so much of an issue, but I suspect it would still be a bit of a nuisance. It's either the heaviest clutch pedal I've ever seen or it's got the shortest travel I've ever seen. I can get the thing to go maybe two centimeters, but if that's enough, that's enough. Steering levers <coughs> on the left as well. So now I have the steering lever and I'm trying to put my foot on the clutch and not get it caught with the instrument panel. So I'm not actually sure I could drive this vehicle myself, but it is by no means the worst of the Soviet vehicles I've been in. So I would wager that the average Soviet crewman wouldn't have too much difficulty in driving the vehicle. Now there are some other nice features of it. For example, gone is the simple clutch and brake steering system. This now has a planetary steering system. The advantage to this is that it still puts power to both sides when turning. So there are multiple stages again. So as you bring it back to the first stage, you're increasing the torque by about 1.35. You pull it back even further, and now you start applying brake. Uh, of course, two tillers, pull back in both, and there's your brake. Accelerator is on the right-hand side. There is an auto-governing system. So what this does is it increases the fuel flow depending on the load. So if you keep your pedal at a set level, you keep the gear in the same gear, then as the vehicle is going over rough terrain, the governor will adjust the fuel load into it so that you continue to traverse on the same speed. Very clever idea, very easy on the driver that way. The gears themselves for the transmission, there are four forward speeds, one reverse. You add to that a transfer case with high and low range, gives you eight forward, two reverse, gives you a good amount of flexibility over all sorts of terrain. The gear pattern, however, is a little bit weird. So the gear stick is to the front right. First you pull straight back for first, you go front and left for second, left and back for third, and then center and front gives you back to fourth. And then reverse is forward uh, to the right. The high-low selector is the lever to the left. Further to the back, you're gonna have your hand throttle for idling or starting purposes. Uh, there is a cool down period. The manual points out that if the temperature is over 70 degrees in the coolant, don't switch off the engine. Let it idle, let it cool down for a couple of minutes, and then kill the master power and that should shut down your engine. Okay, so this will be my driving position. Acceptable, except for the instrument panel chopping off my left leg. Again, may just be my height, or perhaps you can just move the instrument panel. Easily solved. Now if I move the controls back out of the way, 
I have a quick tour around to see what's in here. It's of course, to our left mentioned already, the fuel tank, the internal fuel tank system is about 500 liters. Add to that the external system, we get about 220, 240 kilometers on a single tank. The horn, I don't know why it's always the biggest button inside a Soviet tank, but the horn is right there. Instrument cluster, top center, rev counter, lower left, coolant temperature, engine oil pressure, engine oil temperature. Uh, to the right, there is an ammeter. The one item which is kind of obviously missing from the driver's station is the speedometer. I'm not gonna mind, there is no speedometer here. Uh, other controls, forward down onto the right, you can see the two air tanks for the reserve air starting system. Excellent idea, especially in Soviet winters when the, the electrical system just isn't functioning well enough. Controls to the right in the white box, in addition to the ammeter, you've got the starter motor, there's a fuel pump, and your switches for the lights, internal, external. Fuel pump low and right, the gear selector, high low range option, and throttle. That's it. The breech operator and the TC are both seated on the right hand side of the vehicle facing inwards on very simple cushions which are mounted on the Bonson. In fact, not even mounted, you just cushion. Breach operator has two main roles. Firstly, he's going to move the propellant from the racks on the right hand side of the vehicle onto the loading tray where the loader will then use a rammer to load it into the cannon. His second job, of course, breach operator, is to open the breach. Now, of course, some Killjoy has welded this shut, so we can't go shooting around six, uh, six inch rounds. Uh, however, it is a screw type breech, open, close, easy as. Located over his shoulder, there would be a mounting point here for a fire extinguisher. The submachine gun would be hung from the upper wall here. And over his right is another dome light. To his right then, PC's position. The last position, of course, is a commander. He's seated at the front right of the vehicle, also on this sort of bench cushion facing inwards. Uh, he has slightly better visibility than most. He has seven periscopes in this rotating cupola, in addition to the uh, pretty common MK4. To his front, you're going to see uh, an antenna mount. This is for the 10R or 10RK radio, which would be mounted more or less here. Also, of course, we have the uh, little pop-out plug for the submachine guns. To the left, a little holster for his pistol. Down on the floor, forward under the gun, and to the right is the third internal fuel tank. So we've got three in total, two forward in the crew compartment and one in the rear. Uh, another electrical box with fuses. And uh, I found the speedometer. It's down here on the right. Only other thing I'm gonna find in here, First aid kit could be mounted about here, and directly behind them in the rack is more propellant charges. That's it for the inside, then we'll go back out and close. ISU 152 was produced in two facilities up until 1946 or 1947, depending on who it is you ask. Nearly 2,000 of them were produced. A shortfall in 152mm howitzers, however, meant that a number of vehicles were built as ISU-122s with the A19 122mm howitzer. Uh, it is given sometimes some flack because it has a small ammunition capacity, only 20 rounds. Well, frankly, if you can't kill whatever it is that you're aiming at with 20 rounds per vehicle, you probably wasn't your day anyway. The only other concern you would have is as a driver, even a cameraman was remarking when he was trying to get out of the driver's seat, what do you do if the vehicle is on fire? Inside of that, you can't really argue with the vehicle. It was easy to maintain, easy to repair, easy to drive, well liked by its crews, and easy to learn. Plus, of course, you have a six inch gun. What's not to like? That was the ISU 152, and we'll see you on the next one. Always track track tension. Track tension is good. Track tension is your friend. If you don't do track tension, you lose your track and walk it off, and that's not your friend. Because you will do it in mud, and your driver will hate you, and your loader will hate you. Anyway. <sighs> and fairly simple cast construction. 
Uh, construction. Construction. The track is 650 millimeters wide, single pin, and a single cap. Oh, it's gonna be one of those phrases, isn't it? Ah! There's many things on this tank trying to kill me. Just to the front left of the driver's hatch, you're gonna see a small little port for a, a uh, thing. It is a thing, yes. The track length, 650 millimeter. <laughs> This is going on the blue for real. Um, 